Okay. So, this should finish up PowerPoint uh, G. Probably be a little over 30 minutes. I don't know. We'll see. So, we just uh, finished the hand. So let's go on down to the pelvic girdle. And so this is one fused ilium, ischium, and pubic bone, right? Uh, so these three bones, the pubis, the ischium, and the ilium, uh, they fuse and become one complete bone, and they call that the coxal bone, C-O-X-A-L. Now, don't confuse that with a little tailbone that I'll show you in a minute. That's the coccyx, C-O-C-C-Y-X. All right, so you're looking at the outside of this coxal bone. Sometimes they say os coxae. Um, this is the iliac crest, right? This is what they call the greater sciatic notch. I'm sure you've heard of the sciatic nerve. And that's the lesser sciatic notch. Where the femur sits, you know, the head of the femur sits in this cavity or fossa. That's the acetabulum or acetabular fossa. I learned it cavity, but your book says fossa. I don't know why. All right. Now, remember us talking about spines. A spine doesn't always look like a spine. doesn't always look like a spine. So these two protrusions right here, they're calling spines. They're on the, um, the ilium. So they're the iliac spines so you got one up top one down bottom here so it's the anterior side because your you know your pubic symphysis would be this away um, you know right over there um so this would be the anterior superior iliac spine and this would be the anterior inferior iliac spine you got to kind of use your imagination they're not real pointy here would be the posterior superior iliac spine and here would be the posterior inferior iliac spine. Why are these things important? Because, you know, stuff hooks to them, especially on this front part here. Uh, we haven't learned it yet, but there's the longest muddle, muscle muscle, <laughs> muscle in your body called the um, sartorius. And so it originates from here. There's another really long one that's part of your quadriceps. It's called the um, rectus femoris, and it originates here. So you know darn good and well we're going to point at one of these two things since they're such important, you know, points for origin of, you know, those two muscles. Um, alrighty. This is the ischium. So the tuberosity back here, it'll have a box around it later. It's called the ischial tuberosity. It's got a spine back here, but it's only one spine, so you don't have to you don't have to name it by position like you did these four. You just go ischial spine. Okay. Uh, the crest, the pubic crest, would just be this ridge here. Some people, some books have it going all the way over like that. Um, the pubic tubercle is the bump on the front. Okay. What's a ramus? Remember, it means branch in Latin. Uh, but they, on bones, they tend to be kind of flattened branches, I guess you could say. So that would be the ischial ramus. This would be the pubic ramus, one of them. You have two. So it would be the inferior ramus of the pubis, and uh, or the pubic bone, however you want to say it. And then um, up here would be the superior ramus. So inferior ramus, superior ramus. Um, this, we just flipped it over, right? So now you're looking at the inside part. So there's your iliac fossa. Don't forget, you know, for the females, the, you know, you need room for the baby. So this is kind of flared out, uh, laterally. These ilia are, uh, so this line, it looks like it's an arc kind of makes an arc. Uh, if you look here, oh shoot, I don't have it. Somewhere I do. thought I did. I think it's towards the front. Um, 
that arcuate line is way at the front, I remember now. Right? It forms part of your rim or brim, you know, the pelvic rim or brim. Okay? Um, so when the two coxal bones and the sacrum and the coccyx and the pubic symphysis are all together, right? Then basically you're talking the pelvis, okay? So this is a female pelvis, and you can see the way these uh, bones, these uh, the ilia are projected further laterally, right? Compared to a male, a little more straight up and down. Uh, just making more room for the baby, basically. And then your pelvic inlet and outlet are a little wider. Um, this little angle that these bones make right here. Generally on a female, it's 100 degrees or more. On a male, it's 90 degrees or less. It's not set in stone. You know, there can be variations. Um, what else we got? Oh, the little coccyx. See the little tailbone? Uh, I don't think I'm showing that from the side, but on a uh, male, that tends to point a little more anteriorly. And on a female, it's more straight up and down. Just the same thing, making more room for the for the baby to come through the birth canal there. So every now and then I'll ask, name a couple of differences between a male pelvis and a female pelvis. You can give me some of those differences. Okay, let's go back to where we were. All right, what's this hole? The upgrader Raymond. Okay. Um, what's this thing that looks like an ear? You go, ooh, the auricular surface, uh, you know, on the ilium, for uh, articulating with the sacrum. The sacrum also has an auricular surface. Don't say articular, although they are technically articular surfaces. You'd get a half point. But since it looks like an ear, remember auris, A-U-R-I-S? Remember the... Uh, term that we use for that part of you know that region um that's why we're using auricular surface because it means ear looks like an ear okay there's our spine of the ischium again there's our greater sciatic notch lesser sciatic notch ischial tuberosity you can see the rhema rhema is plural rhema is singular you can see the pubic tubercle the little bump and on this side you can see the pubic symphysis uh, you know, because there, there's going to be fibrocartilage in between this and the other coxal bone, uh, you know, in the in the pubic symphysis. OK. So you can see that's a lot of I'm never going to ask body of these things, by the way. <laughs> um, that's a lot of, uh, you know, landmarks. So let's just look, you know, I forget how many, but it's it's a lot. There's iliac crest. Then you have your four spines, so that's five landmarks. I probably won't give you this anterior gluteal line until we get to muscles. Okay, that's an that's an attachment point for uh, you know muscle. Um, so let's where were we? Iliac crest one. Then you got the four spines. That's five. Greater sciatic knot six. Lesser sciatic knot seven. Ischial spine eight. Ischial tuberosity, 9. Acetabular cavity air fossa, 10. Obturator for ramen, 11. Ramus, ramus, ramus. Now we're up to 14. Pubic tubercle, now we're up to 15. Uh, let's flip them over. Iliac fossa. Where were we at? 15, I guess 16. <laughs> Arcuate line 17. Auricular surface surface 18. And then don't forget your pubic symphysis goes right here. So that'd be technically 19 things. So, you know, it's a lot of stuff here. We can go A, B, C, D, you know, whatever, on um, on a laboratory test. And then on a lecture type question, I can say name a couple of differences between a male and a female pelvis. You know, I could say what well, three bones are fused together to make an, uh, you know, a coxal bone or, or, the, or an os coxae. Um, co os coxae. 
So anyway, just think how the questions can be asked. So here's the femur, really longest bone you got, right? You got a head and you have a neck. No anatomical neck like you have on the uh, humerus, right? Then you got this little dip here. It's almost like a little volcano. It is a hole. Blood vessels go in there. And your book calls it fovea for ligament of head. Uh, the old name is probably still in your book. Look for it. It's like fovea capitis because that looks like a skull cap. You know, that, that head. Does. Okay. <clears throat> and you have a greater and lesser trochanter. Trochanters are big. Don't confuse them with tubercles, right? Because on your humerus, you have greater and lesser tubercles, right? Um, there's a line between them. I'm, it's not very good on our models or charts, so I'm probably not going to uh, hit you with that. Um, on the other side, there's a crest. I'll show you that in a minute. Now, that's pretty prominent. Um, let's go down here. There's the shaft or the diaphysis, obviously. Here's a patellar surface where the kneecap sits. You got two condyles, and they just name them by position. You got a medial and a lateral, so make sure you know this is a medial side, right? Medial condyle, lateral condyle. Then you have two epicondyles, medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle. Flip them over. There's that crest I was saying about, the intertrochanteric uh, crest. Just means in between the trochanters, there's a crest. Okay, this is a cool looking line that goes all the way down. Very important line, point of attachment for uh, some muscles. And it's called the linea aspera. That linea means line, aspera means rough. So rough line. So if I point at it, I want you to go linea aspera. What if you can't remember it and you say rough line? I'll give you half a point because at least you know what it means in Latin. So here's um, intercondylar fossa. There's kind of like a little fossa there. Okay. And then I think we're good. So it's not that many things. So we went head, neck, your two trochanters. One, two, three, four. We did the fovea. Five. We did the epicondyles. Six, seven. We did the condyles. Eight, nine. We did the patellar surface. Ten. Flipped them over. Did the um, intertrochanteric crest, 11, linea aspera, 8, uh, intercondylar fossa. I've lost count. <laughs> Darn it. Anyway, I think it was about, I thought it was about 12 things. Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11, enter uh, trochanteric crest, 12, the line, 13 things. That's what I thought. Um, so, uh, yeah, just don't miss them. It's pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Now, we're headed on down to the tibia. That's this large weight-bearing bone in your lower leg, right? Uh and I know we tend to call the whole thing the leg, but technically this is the leg. And up here would be the thigh. <laughs> okay. So I still, just for convenience, we'll go lower leg. <laughs> right. Um, and so this is a tibia. It has two condyles. I don't like the way they're pointing at them. I, I like to point at them more like where they actually articulate uh, with the bone above. And anyway, you'll have a lateral and a medial condyle. How do you know it's medial? You go down here. That makes up part of your ankle on the inside is the medial malleolus. So you know this is the medial side, right? Um, this big guy is the tibial tuberosity. Uh, that's where your patellar ligament hooks to, right? That goes from your kneecap to your to the tibial tuberosity. And sometimes the doctor will take that little rubber hammer and hit right there to test your reflex, right? Your reflexes. Um, malleolus basically just means mallet or hammer, right? So if you have a medial malleolus, do you have a lateral malleolus over here on your fibula? Make sure you spell fibula correct. Yeah. And then you have a head of the fibula up here and then the diaphysis in between. What's the one thing we're leaving out? This anterior margin or anterior crest. 
right? That's what will accidentally hit the coffee table when you're not looking, right? It hurts like heck. Um, so anyway, that anterior margin or crest. So what's cool, you don't have that many things on the tibia. you got your two condyles. you got your tibial tuberosity. That's a great-looking tuberosity, big, broad base bump. Then you go down here, and you got your uh, medial malleolus. Uh, I think that's all in the crest. I think that's all I gave you on that. Over here, really, you only got the two things, the head of the fibula and the lateral malleolus, not counting the diaphysis or shaft. Okay. Um, and you can see these have an interosseous membrane between them also, just like the radius and ulna. And it kind of pulls a sharp line out on the, you know, because bone will remodel under this, under this pressure or stress, you know, from, from that. Uh, neurosis membrane pulling on there and it'll, you'll kind of get these little knife edges on the bone running all the way down you can kind of see them um, left out one thing intercondylar eminence so you see this thing poking up that's in between the condyles there's an eminence and it emanates up into that fossa remember you had an intercondylar fossa on this guy right so that it fits up in there. Okay. Then there's your kneecap. Probably not going to even make you tell left from right, especially on a uh, laminate. Um, but if you see something looks like a rock, right? That's basically your patella. It's a sesamoid bone. Remember, you get your six shapes of bone, and one of them was sesamoid. Uh, that's a really good sesamoid bone. There's some smaller sesamoids, but this is a good example. Now let's go to the foot. So you got the calcaneus, right? That's your heel bone. And then up here is your talus, T A L U S. So the tibia, for the most part, is resting on that talus down at the bottom. Your medial malleolus is going to be hugged up against it over here. Your fibula, your lateral malleolus, is going to be hugged up this against this over here. Okay, so mainly your tibia is the weight bearing bone. So if you broke your fibula, say you're going for a walk in the woods and you broke your fibula, you could probably hobble out because most of your weight is from that going onto that tibia. Tibia. Okay, it wouldn't be fun, <laughs> right? But you could probably hobble out. All right, navicular bone. So the navicular. Right? It's shaped like a little canoe. And so navicular is from the same root word as navy, you know, and so that should remind you of boat. Right? I think that's what it means. Um, this one looks like a cube, so they call it the cuboid bone. These three, one, two, three, right there, they're all called cuneiform bones. So you have a lateral one, you have an intermediate one, and you have a medial one. So I assume you know what's lateral and what's medial on this. You know, your big toe is over here by the medial side. Um, so make sure you get the, what if I just put the pointer and go, what is that? A, A, A. You just go cuneiform bones. If I ask you a specific one, yeah, this one will be lateral cuneiform, intermediate cuneiform medial cuneiform. What are these guys? Metatarsals. And you have to number them, right? Because you can't just say metatarsal if I point at one. You got to tell me what number it is. And so that's number one. That's number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. Right? And then just like in your hand, do you have phalanges? Yeah. So on the big toe, you only have two. Proximal phalanx distal phalanx where all the rest of them you have proximal middle distal proximal middle distal proximal middle distal even on the little toe they're tiny but proximal middle distal phalanges um technically these are a little bitty long bones here because there's epiphyseal lines all right um so when you're walking, most of your weight, like 80% of it, from what I remember, goes over this first meta 
tarsal and the big toe. So that's that, and you can see how big that bone is compared to these. And then this kind of, this fifth meta, tar, did I say tarsal? I hope I said tarsal, not carpal. Uh, the fifth metatarsal, um, that's, it's kind of for lateral stability too, and probably some weight bearing too. Uh, so you can see it's pretty, it's pretty thick too. All right. So make sure you call these tarsals, T-A-R-S-A-L, metatarsals, where in the hand they're meta carpals it's easy to mix that up i may have done it just a second ago i'll have to listen to it and see um but don't do that <laughs> okay uh so i think we're good so generally when i show cuboid and navicular and cuneiforms i do it from the view from up top that's just easier to tell especially on a you know on a, on a laminate or a or a picture like this all right so don't forget to give me the numbers of the phalanx or the metatarsal. Don't forget to give me the proximal, the middle, or the distal if it applies. Okay, as far as the uh, phalanges. Ligaments. Hey, hey, we're doing good. Um, so ligaments. So here's a hint. If you cannot remember the name of the ligament, just name the bone that it connects to the other bone that it connects and sometimes you get it right and in this case you would get it right the dang i can't remember i can't remember but i know that's a clavicle and i know this is the sternum even though that's a specific part of the sternum so i'm just gonna go sterno clavicular ligament boom you got it right you don't even have to tell me anterior sternoclavicular they divide this one up it's to an anterior and a posterior one but if I put the tape on it, just go sternoclavicular. I'm happy with that. Sternoclavicular ligament. Okay, so that worked. All you did was name which two bones it connected. It doesn't work here necessarily. So this is the scapula. Remember, you have your chromium process and your coracoid process. Well, look, there's a ligament stretched in between them. Well, you can't go scapular, scapular ligament. That wouldn't make any sense at all. So you have to name the landmarks. Oh, it's going from the coracoid to the acromion, coracoacromial ligament. Then you look at this guy. You go, well, that's going from the acromion to the clavicle. Then you got, oh, acromioclavicular ligament. Then you got two heads of this one, but I kind of call it one ligament. Um, I guess technically it's two. Um, but you would go coraco, because it's coracoid process. Going to the clavicle, coracoclavicular ligaments. Okay. Now, anything that says tendon, throw it out. There's no tendons on this test. Now, sometimes I run out of stuff to point at, and I could point here, glenohumeral ligaments. So you, oh wait, it's going from my glenoid. Remember, you got your glenoid uh, cavity under here, and then here's your hum humerus, glenohumeral. If I, you know, say, what if I went A, B, C? I'd say, dang, I need one more thing to point at. Oh, yeah. Glenohumeral ligament. I guess I could point at a bursa and say, what is that, bursa? What's it filled with? Synovial fluid. Right? But think about how questions can be asked on a, on a picture. This, you're looking at that glenoid cavity or fossa. I say fossa, but your book says cavity. Um, because to me, a fossa is more of a shallow dip where a cavity is deeper. Now, this is a pretty shallow dip, but you do, they didn't draw it that well, but you have a you have a cartilaginous lip that goes all the way around it. And that's called the glenoid labrum. Labrum just means lip. And that does make it deeper and makes it look more like a cavity. So maybe that's why they changed it. I don't know. Um, any tendons, throw them out. Throw them out. Uh, I, I don't I don't like this picture, so I, I would never point at the glenoid labrum here, but I could ask you a lecture question. What's the name of the cartilage that goes around the glenoid um, cavity? You know, that makes that makes it basically deeper, <laughs> you know, functionally deeper, you know, and you would go glenoid labrum. Uh, so throw anything that says tendons out, no tendons on the test. All I can ask you about a tendon is 
what is it made of and that's really from last test you know like dense regular connective tissue and what does a tendon generally connect you would go muscle to bone all right so let's go down here some ligaments have their very own name and so it's not going to help you to name the two bones that connect this one is is one of these guys so it's got it's called the annular ligament and so it wraps around that little radial head. Um, so the annular ligament, uh, you've heard that word before, like uh, uh, and, uh, annular fibrosis, remember? In the, uh, uh, in the uh, intervertebral, well, sorry, in the disc. Yeah, intervertebral disc. Um, uh, what was it? Annulus fibrosis, right. Um, so it's from that same root word. You know, you go around the sun annually. The earth goes around the sun annually. It makes rings. So same thing here. This is going around. It's kind of like making rings around. It. Okay, so that socks that uh, head into the, a little a little notch here. Okay, remember that radial notch on the ulna. So, all right. So by the way, if you if a little kids, you gotta watch you gotta watch them because his head of the radius is not very big, and then if you pull on them with one arm, it's possible to dislocate that little uh, head out of its notch. You know, usually they can pop them right back in. Uh, the emergency room can, but it's uh, it's a pretty common little injury. You know, that kids get when they're playing um, because it's just not socked in there really well. They're still growing, and that little head of the radius is just not, uh, it's not held in there very well. All right. Retinaculum. So, technically, this is a ligament. So, this is the extensor side, so you call it extensor retinaculum, and it's holding these tendons down, right? It keeps them from popping up when you extend that wrist. Okay, on the flexor side, same thing. You have a retinaculum. It's not showing it very well. Uh, I'll try to put a good one on our, uh, our models, our arm models, our plastic models. They have pretty good ones. Um, so I might have a picture of that. Um, so the flexor retinaculum holds those tendons down on this flexor side. There can be an exception to that. About 90% of us have this tendon right here is above that retinaculum not everybody about 10 percent of the people it's kind of buried just like the rest of them um, and that'll be important when we're starting to name muscles don't worry about it but the palmaris longus has this tendon that tends to ride above the retinaculum on most of us um all right i think retinaculum is from the greek or latin for for net if i remember right Oh, I forgot about this. It's not the greatest picture, but you're looking at the back. Here's the sacrum in green. And then this is a ligament, right? And then that's a ligament going across there on the other side. Uh, this, just name it. We've got a kind of cool name. So this is the sacrum. And this is the ischial tuberosity. So what did they name this ligament? Sacrotuberous. What did they name this ligament? It's kind of a little bit harder to see going from the sacrum to the ischial spine. Sacrospinous. And those probably are in your lab book. You know, it's probably the last two ligaments given in your lab book. Check it out. Um, so sacrotuberous, sacrospinous. All right, so here's one that works for you. So yeah, dang, I can't remember. I'm just going to name the bones it connects. So if it's going from the ilium, to the femur, it would be iliofemoral ligament. Technically, you got two heads on that on that one, right? But I just kind of call it one ligament, iliofemoral ligament. Then if it's going from the ischium to the femur, you go ischiofemoral ligament. Then you turn around and look at the other side, going from the, these are all, they're pretty short. And then it's going from the pubic bone to the femur, from pubis to the femur, that would be pubo femoral ligament so what's nice you just named which bones these are connecting you got all three of them right? um 
that's your little ligamentum capitis femoris. Your book doesn't call it that anymore. I think it just says, uh, I think it just says ligament for head or something like that. Uh, I still call it ligamentum capitis femoris. Your book might say ligament for head of femur or something like that. There's a little fat pad down deep in this uh, acetabular fossa. Uh, and that's if you say you get hit or say you fall and you land on your, on your, you know, femur, <laughs> right? Hits the floor, you know, that side of your femur there. And then it'll drive that head medially. And this will kind of cushion that, hopefully. Um, oh, another thing I forgot to tell you. Um, if you've taken chemistry, vinegar is called acetic acid, <laughs> right? And then, so if you look at this word, acetabulum, in Latin, that means vinegar cup, right? Probably from the Bible, right? Remember, these things were named a long, long time ago. So if you can't remember acetabular cavity or acetabulum or acetabular fossa, uh, but you go vinegar cup, you'll still get half a point, right? The knee. You know, it's going to be several structures here because this gets torn up a lot. You're going to see these injuries a lot. So this is, uh, let's look at this one. You're looking at the front here. This is the medial side. So I use the old names. Medial collateral ligament. The new name is tibial collateral ligament. Not too many people use that. It does make more sense because you're naming the bone. But. Almost all the docs and nurses go MCL, which means medial collateral ligament. Now, if you just if you just give me the letters like MCL, you're only going to get half a point. So give me the whole thing, medial collateral ligament. Over here is going to be your lateral collateral ligament, LCL, right? For a half a point. <laughs> uh, it the new name they're trying to go with is fibular collateral ligament. Which makes sense. You're naming, you're naming the bone down here. Um, but I like the old names. Especially lateral collateral. It almost rhymes. Right? And then on the front here. You have an anterior cruciate ligament. Otherwise known as the ACL. Right? Anterior cruciate. And in the back. You can kind of see part of it here. Is a posterior cruciate. So these two. Two guys make like a little cross, anterior cruciate and the posterior cruciate. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but that stabilizes, you know, cruciate means cross, like crucifix. So that's stabilizing the knee from front to back when they're intact. The problem is that ACL pops pretty easy. It, it's pretty easy to damage that. A lot of ski injuries, you know, they'll damage that or tear that in half. Um, okay. What else we got? That's a meniscus, and that's a meniscus. So this would be a lateral meniscus, and this would be a medial meniscus. So make sure you look and figure out what's lateral and what's medial on this knee, right? Okay, the patella and ev the patella and everything's gone off of that. Here it is, back at front, and there's your patellar ligament going from your patella to your tibia. But they took all this off so you could see underneath it here. Now on the back, so here you're looking at the back. There's your PCL or your posterior cruciate. Don't pay attention to these fibers here. That's just technically, I guess, that's part of that uh, lateral meniscus. So if I put the pointer, I'll put it here. That's your PCL. Okay. Now, on that first slide, not first slide, but towards the front, they talked about something called a terrible triad injury of the knee. So, you know, just by the name, three things are going to get torn up. So they didn't, they didn't that, they're not showing it very well here. Um, but the, the medial collateral, the MCL gets torn up, the medial meniscus gets torn up, and the anterior cruciate pops. So that's, I don't know if a hockey puck would do this, but anyway, usually it's like a football player hitting right here. And you can see this is getting hit on the lateral side. So that's causing these bones to do this. What's that going to do? It's going to rip it off of the meniscus. It's going to rip the MCL, and it can, you know, it's probably going to rip that ACL too. 
because it's not very sturdy. So that's a pretty devastating injury. You know, it's hard for a football player or a soccer player or whatever to recover from that unless they have some really good surgery and really good rehab. Um, so anyway, I can go name three structures torn up in a uh, MCL. I mean, sorry, in a uh, terrible triad. And you'll go MCL, ACL, medial meniscus. If you've already spelled out m medial collateral, then yeah, on a question like this, you can just go MCL. So long as once you've written it out so I know that you know what it means. Same thing with anterior cruciate. Okay. So the first time you say those, spell them out. And then if I ask a question pertaining to them later, you can just give me the letters. Okay, that's fine. Dang, we're almost done. So let's get on down to the ligaments at the foot. So, do you have a retinaculum down here? Yeah, it's an extensor retinaculum because it's on this side. And you do have a superior and an inferior extensor retina. I don't care. Just go extensor retinaculum if I point at one of these, <laughs> right? Um, okay. Now, let's look at the ankle area. So this is on the inside. There's your tibia, so that would be your medial malleolus, correct? So you see the way this flows out like a river delta? That's called the deltoid ligament, right? Has nothing to do with the deltoid muscle up by your shoulder, right? <laughs> but it is the same. Whoop, it is the same word, basically. Okay, so this is on the medial side. Ah, then you look on the lateral side. Go, dang it, there's one, there's two, there's three little ligaments holding this uh, that we're giving you that are holding this uh, fibula down into place here. Um, and say, well, I forgot what it's called, but I'm going to just name the bone to the bone and see if it works. Calcaneo, calcaneo fibular. Boom, you got it. It's going from the calcaneus bone to the fibula. And then you got it. Here's where you got to watch out. You're going to go, well, this is going from the talus to the fibula. Well, and that's going from the talus to the fibula. So I'm going to just call them talofibular ligaments. Well, that's true, but you're only going to get half point on something like that because this is the anterior talofibular, and that's the posterior talofibular. Uh, these are just your intertarsal joints, right, in there. There's little ligaments in between there, too. Um, and it's not showing it real well, but on the bottom of the foot, you're going to have a long plantar ligament. And that's where you can get plantar fasciitis. You know, a lot of people have trouble with that. Hurts really bad. <laughs> right? Uh, and I'll try to find you a much better picture of long plantar. Okay. Uh, so what happens? I remember I, I said you could, uh, I could ask you a, a, a damage question. Like you invert your foot. Right? Which ligaments get torn up? Or you evert your foot? Which ligaments in the ankle get torn up? So let's do evert first. So the sole of your foot is going out. Right? So what's that going to do? It's going to pull on this guy. So it's going to stretch or possibly tear your deltoid in an eversion injury of inversion where the sole of your foot is going in, you know, medial. Kind of like you're rolling your ankle. It's a pretty common injury, especially, uh, you know, on high heels. It happens a lot. And then that is going to stretch these guys. So in an inversion injury, you're going to get a cal uh, uh, calcaneal fibular could get torn or stretched. And your anterior and posterior tallow fibulars could get torn or stretched. So don't forget, that's kind of like a lecture question, you know, which... Ligaments get torn up in an inversion injury versus an eversion injury. Um, and same thing on a whiplash question. You know, um, if you hyperflex your neck, then you're stretching things on the back, like the supraspinous ligament and the interspinous ligament. Whereas if you hyper extend your neck, let's see if I got a picture of that. Whoop. Where'd it go? I thought I had it. Huh. 
did it disappear? Maybe it's just not on this particular PowerPoint. I'll be darn. Anyway, um, but if you hyper extend your neck, you're going to stretch the uh, anterior longitudinal ligament. All right. So, oh, that was on PowerPoint number two, if I remember right. Okay. Um, on PowerPoint F, I guess I should say. All right. So, don't forget your bones. Right? Don't forget your ligaments. Make sure you learn all of the bones and the landmarks first and then go and study your ligaments because your ligaments are generally named after bones or landmarks, right? Um, so, 40 minutes, not too bad. All right, so I'll post this one for you. Okay.